Let's take our Bibles tonight and turn, if you would please, to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. You'll have to turn the page in your Bible probably because we're going to be reading verses 18 through 20. I am so glad to see you here tonight. Thank you for being a part of the service. I always call the midweek service that pause that refreshes. And I think I got that from a Pepsi commercial from years ago. That pause that refreshes. And it certainly is. I believe I speak for all of you, but I need the midweek service. And I know I'm here during the day. And, uh, but I need the midweek service. And uh, this is good for me to be here. We are continuing now. Um, as in our Brother Dale, I believe there's a ring up here in my monitors. If you'll pull that down just a little bit, and that will be fine. Thank you very much. Continuing now in our series on what we believe, and this evening we're going to be looking at what we believe about the Great Commission. What we believe about the Great Commission. And we're looking in Matthew chapter 28. We're going to read verses 18 through 20. And since there's only a few verses, let's read all of them out loud together, please, starting with verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So, Heavenly Father, I would ask, please, that you help me to convey the truth that is here. And Lord, this seems to be no longer the great commission in so many churches, but it is the great omission. It is the thing that is left out of so many lives. And without it, a lost and dying world will remain a lost and dying world. So, Father, I pray you'd help me now, and I do ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And please be seated. Let me just ask this. Is this real loud to you out there? No. It's not? Perfect. It's perfect. Wow, that makes me feel so good. I'll be out in public, and I'll say something. They'll ask me a question, and they'll say, perfect. And I say, thank you. You're the first person that's called me perfect all day. Yeah, I appreciate that. <clears throat> and then they always smile, and when I walk away, I'm sure they're thinking, man, that is one stupid guy. And he's far from perfect, that's for sure. All righty. Dale, maybe a little bit more down on these, if you would, please. That would help me some. We're nearing the end of the study, though, and uh, what we believe about uh, here at Timberline Baptist Church. And we're getting real close to the end of that st study. Now, like I said, I will not be here uh, next Wednesday. Brother Bob Marvin is going to be preaching on Wednesday night. And uh, when I get back, we're going to begin a rather extensive study on what we believe about the modern-day charismatic movement. It's something you don't want to miss. And the truth of the matter is it's a thing that's misunderstood by so many so often. And we're going to use the Word of God, and we're going to teach what's going on in today's world. We see it all over uh, Christian or so-called Christian television stations and on so-called Christian radio stations. What is the modern-day uh, charismatic movement? We're going to be looking at that in depth. I encourage our online family to join us and not, be, uh, not make yourself scarce during that study. And uh, so please understand that. I might as well say this to our online family tonight anyway. Uh, there will not be uh, a live stream on Sunday, this coming Sunday, and there will not be a live stream next Wednesday night. And I'll announce that to you all on Facebook, so be watching for that. There will not be a live stream on this coming Sunday, and there will not be one on Cinco de Mayo. So please keep that in mind because we are not going to be in town. And I'm taking my phone with me, and that's my camera already. So what do you believe? And why do you believe that particular way? I think that's a fair question. What do, what do you believe? I mean, can you base what you believe on what the Word of God says, or do you only base it on what you think or whatever it might be? We have to have the Word of God teach us. So let me just go through the list. I, I was asked this week <clears throat> by my brother. He said, well, what are you teaching on Wednesday nights? 
And I started listing it off. He stopped me about halfway through the list, and he said, man, that's a lot of subjects. And I thought, yeah, let me read you the rest of them. What we believe about the Bible, about the Trinity, about creation, about Jesus, the Son of God, about Jesus' physical bodily resurrection from the dead, about the Holy Spirit. And remember, after that study, we, we had a study on sins that Christians can commit against the Holy Spirit. You know, you think about where God says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. And so there, are, there were sins that we mentioned that a person, a Christian, a believer, can commit against the Holy Spirit of God. And then we had a study on uh, what we believe about the state of man, what we believe about the scope of salvation, what we believe about the becoming a child of God. What does it, does it take to be saved? Today, so many things have been added to God's simple plan of salvation. I mean, you've got to turn from your sin. You've got to quit this. You've got to start this. You, if you're not faithful, you're not saved to begin with. I mean, there's so many different things that people say. And what we learned on that was simply uh, getting saved involves believing the gospel. And anything added to that is not, is not salvation. And so we studied that in quite a bit of depth, by the way. And uh, let's see here, um, we learned about what we believe about eternal salvation. You know, that old Baptist doctrine, you know, once saved, always saved. As the lady said to me who had visited our church, oh, you all believe that old Baptist doctrine about once saved, always saved. And I said, yes, ma'am, we do, but it's not a Baptist doctrine. It is a Bible doctrine. And then we learned about uh, the blessed hope, the rapture of all believers. We learned about uh, the resurrection of the dead. That, that was something, not Jesus' resurrection, but the resurrection of the dead. What does the Bible teach about that? What we believe about the church, what we believe about believers' baptism, what we believe about the Lord's Supper. Those are the things that we've covered so far. But as we continue in this doctrinal study of what we believe, tonight we're going to see another aspect of the local church. We, we learned about the church. We learned about baptism. We learned about the Lord's Supper, all these things having to do with the local church. And tonight we're going to be looking at what we believe about the Great Commission. Let me say it again, what we believe about the Great Commission. Here's what we have in our doctrinal statement of our church. We believe that the local church is the agency through which God has chosen to accomplish his work in the world. A New Testament Baptist church is an organized body of baptized believers banded together for work, worship, edification, the observance of ordinances, and the fulfillment of the Great Commission. That's all found in our doctrinal statement. You say, Pastor, you said the Timberline Baptist Church, and a Baptist church is. That's right. This is what we believe is Timberline Baptist Church. I had a man... Um, he wrote me this week and asked me, why are you a Baptist? Why are you a Baptist? And I thought it was a great question. I've been asked that numerous times by a lot of people. I couldn't believe how many people, they have the same question, why Baptist? That's, they don't ever say, why are you a Baptist? They say, why Baptist? And so I send them back a, a statement that I have already prepared on why I'm a Baptist. And what they had done was they had equated Baptist with a denomination. I am not a Baptist by denominational preference. I am a Baptist by doctrinal belief. And that's what you have. You know, Baptists never came out of the Catholic Church. They were never Protestants. Protestants, we've, the Baptist Church has never come out of the Catholic Church because it was never in the Catholic Church. Now, Lutherans came out of the Catholic Church. Methodists came out of the Catholic Church. Presbyterians came out of the Catholic Church. Numbers of others, and they are considered to be Protestants or Protestants. But Baptists do not ever have a history of coming out of the Catholic Church. And so I, I corrected the individual, and I simply said, you have, you have said I'm a Baptist by denominational preference. And I said, no, sir. I'm a Baptist by doctrinal positioning, what I believe the Word of God teaches. And so that's why we have that in here. Now, what is the Great Commission? It is Jesus' command for believers everywhere to spread the good news of the gospel, and it's found in various passages of the Word of God, not just one that somebody might use as a pet passage. And they say, well, this is the Great Commission. Well, it's found other places, and I want you to see that tonight. First of all, take your Bible and go to Matthew 28. We just read there a moment ago. 
And we're going to find here the Great Commission, as is stated by many people, uh, as the Great Commission. And it says in verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power. That word power there is the word authority. It's not the word dunamis, which means the uh, dynamite of God. No, this is the word for authority. He has power and authority, you see. Uh, be death hath no more dominion over him, no more power over him, no more authority over him. The word here is all power, all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen, as it says there. Inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, Matthew wrote his gospel to present Jesus as the king of the Jews. And I think this is probably common knowledge to most believers, is that Matthew presents Jesus as the king of the Jews. And he shows the authority that he has in the Great Commission. He said all power was given to Jesus. And it was given to him by the Father. And all nations would one day be under his rule. You real, we're studying in Revelation right now. One day, Jesus is going to set foot in Jerusalem on this earth and set up an earthly kingdom where he will reign for a thousand years and we will rule and reign with him. And here as the king of the Jews, he says, I've got all authority. I've got all authority. And now all nations would one day be under his rule. So let me give you three facts about that. Number one, all nations need the gospel. You can't think of one that doesn't need the gospel, can you? I mean, you go to deepest, darkest Africa, you go to deepest, darkest New Guinea, you go to deepest, darkest uh, Australia and to the aboriginal tribes, you go to the furthest reaches of the world. There is not one place on this earth that does not need the gospel. Secondly, all nations need salvation by God's grace. And there are so many cultic beliefs out there today. And they're not going to get to heaven by believing a cultic belief. They're not going to get to heaven by being baptized or joining a church or becoming a Baptist or becoming a Lutheran or becoming a Methodist or becoming a Church of Christ or anything else. The only way you go to heaven is by getting born again on this side of the grave. Because you're not going to get born again on the other side of the grave. Oh, how many times have I heard in my soul winning time as a Christian... And I started doing this as a teenager, as a teenager. My bus director and my youth pastor taught me God's simple plan of salvation and how to tell people how to be saved. But how many times have I heard people say, well, I'm just going to wait till I die and God's going to weigh out my good works in one hand and my bad works in the other. He says, I think I'm going to do all right. That's what they say of all things. Or other people have foolishly said, well, I'm just going to wait till the very end, you know, a deathbed salvation. Say, so do you believe in deathbed salvation? Well, of course I do. Jesus will save you anytime. Think about the thief on the cross. Moments before he died, he said, remember me. Wilt thou remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom? And Jesus said, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Yes, I believe in deathbed experiences. But when somebody is that presumptuous on God saying, well, I'm going to wait till I'm on my deathbed. The truth of the matter is you don't know how long you're going to be on a deathbed. In fact, you might not ever make it to the bed itself. You might just die out right there. So all nations need the gospel. Number two, all nations need salvation by God's grace. And thirdly, all nations need Jesus. He is still the answer. Um, uh, how can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. John chapter 14 and verse 6. So he's the only way. Neither is there salvation in any other. Acts 4.12. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, you see. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Timberline Baptist Church. Wait a minute, it doesn't say that. But the gift of God is eternal life through uh, the Catholic Church. No, it doesn't say that. The gift of God is eternal life through the Methodist. No, it doesn't say that. But wait a minute, the gift of, gift of God is eternal life through the waters of the Baptist. No, it doesn't say that. No, it says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that's it. There is no other way. Uh, a, a singer that uh, we, years ago we heard, and uh, uh, he sings a song on a tape that I've got here, or CD that I have here, is simply called No Other Way. 
and because there is no other way. No, nobody has another uh, different way of getting to heaven. And so therefore, Matthew gives us that admonition in the Great Commission. Secondly, the book of Mark. Mark chapter 16, you have your Bible there. And uh, those of you who are watching at home, I hope you have your Bible, or at least ways you can reach for one. The Bible says in Mark chapter 16, beginning in verse 14, afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and abraded them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But notice what salvation is here. He says, He that believeth not shall be damned. Salvation is in the belief. Baptism should follow salvation. Like the three that were baptized on Sunday uh, here in our baptistry. Uh, like the name of the four that I mentioned tonight of our bus kids who are now adults, every one of them got baptized on a particular day. That did not save them, but it followed their salvation. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils, and they shall speak in new tongues, and they shall take up serpents, and they shall drink any dead thing. A deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs and signs following. Amen. Under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, Mark wrote his gospel to the Christians who were in Rome. And these Christians in Rome were suffering under great persecution. And he presented Jesus to them, not as the king of the Jews, but as the suffering servant, you see. The Bible says in Mark 10, 45, and I love this. I wish every Christian would memorize it. It says, for even the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. Uh, for those of you who are Bible buffs, the word minister here is the word deacon that we find in the word of God. A deacon is a servant, not a leader, but a servant. And in Timberline Baptist Church, the deacons who have served here are there as an advisory board when the pastor needs advice and things like that. But they serve as servants. That's the word deacon. Look it up in any Greek dictionary. The word deacon means a servant. And Jesus says, I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many, you see. Verse 15, the gospel is to be proclaimed to every creature and we're supposed to be the proclaimers. Under the pulpit here, I remember years ago, uh, we had, uh, in fact, let me just get, get it out here. My son David is now an employee of faith comes by hearing in Albuquerque, I almost said Albuquerque, because <laughs> that's how I've always heard it pronounced, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We've been doing business with them for 30 years. We started our, the Tate ministry in our church had died a natural death, and uh, I had a couple of men that said, we need to get it going again, and so we bought 100 tapes and 100 cases. One of the men bought the tapes, the other man bought the cases. I think the man that bought the cases got the better end of the deal. And that revived our tape ministry in 1990. And uh, so that we got that from Faith Comes by Hearing. Well, Faith Comes by Hearing is, about, is in the business of spreading the gospel. This is called a proclaimer. We are to be proclaimers. The proclaimer has a solar battery because some places you don't have batteries. It has battery power. It has uh, AC current power and all of that. And on the inside of this little unit is the word of God. And faith comes by hearing is putting it in literally hundreds of languages. They go into a village and those people can't read because they don't have an alphabet, but they can speak a language. The word of God is spoken in their language so they can hear. And what does faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. So this proclaimer here is a plastic thing 
that you can set into a village in deepest, darkest Africa, and they can sit around, and I've watched this actually demonstrated. They sit around in a circle and listen to the word of God. God says we're the proclaimers. We don't have... We don't have a solar battery. We don't run on batteries. We don't run on alternating current either. But we do have a voice. And we're, the Bible says here in verse 15 that we are to go and we are to preach the gospel to every creature. And the truth is, and how I thank the Lord for that. Uh, in fact, as faith comes by hearing, we did something else with them here. We've done it a number of times. And that is the military Bible sticks where we would uh, uh, give toward an offering and then they would use that to purchase these little Bible sticks. I have some under the pulpit right now that they send to soldiers. And it has a battery and it has the word of God recorded on it and a set of head, uh, little earbuds that they can listen to the word of God. And we've participated in that many times in proclaiming the word of God to a lost and dying world. And every soldier who received one of these, there was a card inside of it that they could send one to somebody in their family. I'm all for that. But Christians don't proclaim anymore. We're not out spreading the gospel like we ought to. And we are supposed to be the proclaimers. If Christians were servants like Jesus was, the gospel would not be hiding in the hearts of so many Christians. Servants serve just as Jesus served. So that's the second great commission, Matthew and then Mark. Now I want you to, oh, you knew I was going to go there, didn't you? The book of Luke. Take your Bible and go to Luke, chapter 24, and we're going to read verses 44 through 53. I realize some of you who are listening to my voice tonight online, you never realized that there was more than one great commission in the word of God, but there obviously is. Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 44, it says, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. <laughs> oh, how foolish those preachers are who say that salvation is not in the Old Testament and that Jesus is not in the Old Testament. You can find salvation starting with Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, where a deliverer was promised. And look what Jesus said. He said, he, it's very amazing. He says, while I was with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Wow. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, thus it is written and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and uh, to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Well, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, Luke presented Jesus as the son of man. So we have the king of the Jews. We have the suffering servant, and now we have Jesus as the son of man uh, to a man named Theophilus. He gave him this. The name Theophilus, by the way, in Acts chapter 1, O Theophilus, it means a lover of God or one who is loved by God. And so the Bible says in Luke 19, 10, and here we are in Luke, and remember he's presented in Luke as the son of man. It says, for the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. So here we have Jesus as the king of the Jews, and we have Jesus as the suffering servant, and now here he is the son of man, and it says the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Why did Jesus come? He came to save sinners. What message, what is the message of the gospel, by the way? It's twofold. It's mentioned here in this passage. Repentance, first of all. Boy, is that a hot topic today among many Christians. All our lives, we've heard that repentance means to turn from your sin. But isn't that a work and we're saved by grace and not by works? 
There's not a sin you can give up in order to be saved. And who were the most righteous people by the law in Jesus' day? It was the Pharisees. And even the Apostle Paul said he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. In other words, they had to memorize the entire Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Had to have it all memorized, familiar with it. And remember when Nicodemus came to Jesus and said, I don't understand being born again. And what did Jesus say to him? He says, you're a teacher in Israel and you don't know about being born again. The only place they could find that would be in the Old Testament because there was no New Testament at that time. And so, what was repentance? You know who the first person was in the Bible who repented? The very first person in the Bible who repented. It was God. The very first person. He gave up no sin. It said it repented him that he had made man. But God gave up no sin. The word repent literally means to have a change of mind. Now why did the Pharisees need to, have, to repent or they would likewise perish? Because they believed wrongly. How many times have I said it from this pulpit? You cannot believe in the wrong Jesus and be saved. That's why the Mormon religion has the wrong Jesus in their Bible. You cannot put your trust in the wrong Jesus. You can't put your trust in the Spanish Jesus or the black Jesus or any other Jesus that's mentioned by any other cultic group. You can only put your trust in the Jesus of the Bible. And the one that's in the Bible is not the same as the one that is in the Mormon Bible. And so they have to have repentance. They have to have a change. They can't add Jesus to their false gods. They can't add Jesus to their, uh, to their false beliefs. No, they have to have a repentance. And the, the, the Pharisees in that day believed that you were, you were delivered by God by keeping the law. And the Bible says very plainly in the New Testament that there shall no flesh be saved by the, by the keeping of the law. Nobody can be saved by keeping the law. Not one person. It's interesting. And so repentance has to be a change of mind that agrees with God that we are all sinners and agrees what Jesus did for us on the cross. That's what true repentance is. 1992, June, Dr. Bob Porter and his wife came to our church for our second anniversary at Timberline Baptist Church when we were located up in Woodland Park. Bob Porter's father uh, about, it was Ford Porter the author of God's Simple Plan of Salvation, the track that we've used here for 30 years, and the gospel track that I grew up with in my home church, God's Simple Plan of Salvation. Well, they had revamped it and rewritten it. They didn't change hardly anything in it, but they defined the word repentance, which I thought was a good thing, because it was not defined in Ford Porter's version of the track, but Bob Porter defined it. Because of that, there was one preacher in America who was the largest purchaser of God's simple plan of salvation threatened to never buy the tracks again. Now they kept buying them because it is about the best track that's ever been written that's reached the world. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And, um, and in that track, it, it defines what repentance is. And that's what made that pastor mad because he believed you've got to turn from your sin to get saved. And they say you turn from your sin by turning to Jesus. They can mix it up any way they want to. You can't do any good works and be saved. You're saved by God's grace or you're not saved at all. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, that's why the Bible says neither is there salvation in any other, you see. Nothing, no good work that we can do. So repentance had to be taught. In other words, they had to quit believing what they were believing and they had to start believing on the Lord Jesus rather than rejecting him. So Jesus said repentance had to be preached. The second thing was remission of sins. And that's God's response to man's repentance. He willingly paid the debt for the sins of man with his own blood. <laughs> you are not your own. You are bought with a price. And what was that price? It was the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. Oh, the word of God is so clear on that. In fact, I'm just going to take my Bible and go to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5. And I, there, because there are people today that have different opinions about the blood of Jesus. And the Bible says in Revelation 1, 5, it says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. The blood of Jesus Christ is necessary. 
But somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus, they're not going to be saved. They got their belief in the wrong Jesus. They're trusting the Ten Commandments. Remember me telling you the illustration? Uh, I witnessed to a lady one day, and, I, and I, she says, oh, she said, I'm Catholic. And I said, oh, that's great. I'm glad. I said, you go to church. I said, so you believe the Bible, don't you? She said, yes, I do. I believe the Bible. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, ma'am, if you were to die today, God forbid that you die today. But if you were to die today, do you know for sure that you'd go to heaven? She said, oh, yes, yes, I would go to heaven. And I said, that is great. And boy, I never downplay that. I, somebody says they know they're going to heaven. That's wonderful because a lot of people say, can anybody know? Does anybody know? Nobody can know for sure. This woman, she is shorter than I am, so that's really short. And so she looked up at me and she said, oh, yes, I, I know I'm going to heaven. And I said, that's wonderful, ma'am. I said, how do you know, upon what do you base that, that you know you're going to heaven? She said, I keep the Ten Commandments. I said, really? I said, what are they? And she looked at me and she said, uh... I said, all right. I said, let's just make it a little easier. I said, uh, where are they in the Bible? Uh, I said, you mean to tell me you're trusting the Ten Commandments to take you to heaven, and first of all, you don't know what they are, and secondly, you don't know where they are? She went, gulp. And I said, ma'am, I said, would you like to know what the Bible says about going to heaven and how to know for sure? She said, I sure would. And I took the Bible and I showed her God's simple plan of salvation. And that dear Catholic lady trusted Jesus as her Savior that night. Oh, what a, what a great blessing that was. But you see, there's not salvation in any other, none whatsoever. And so uh, the spreading of the gospel involves repentance. Somebody needs to know uh, and the truth about Jesus and the remission of sins where God's God's part when we repent and have the right belief. We are then commanded to witness to others of what we know. Number four, you know where I'm going, don't you? Matthew, he was the king of the Jews. Mark, Jesus was presented as the suffering servant. Luke, he was presented as the son of man. And number four, the book of John, John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. The Bible says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said, Unto them, Peace be unto you. Now, I've commented on this before, but why did Jesus say, Peace be unto you? Well, I'll tell you exactly why. They were hiding up there scared to death that they were going to come kill him. And here comes the dead guy and just shows up in the room. And he said, peace. He said, don't be afraid. He said, it's me. Be not afraid. It is I. Peace be unto you. And when he had said so, he showed them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them, peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. What a great song, by the way, in our songbook. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. And inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, John now presents Jesus as the Son of God. So we had the king of the Jews, we had the uh, suffering servant, we had the son of man, and now we have him presented as the son of God. And so he shows how the father sent Jesus to this earth and how we are to witness on his behalf. It's interesting, there are several parts to the Great Commission. First of all, God wants all men to be saved. That's understood. And in fact, Paul wrote to Timothy and said, who will that all men be saved? And I had uh, somebody tell me one time because they were Calvinists of all things and didn't believe that God would save everybody, but only the chosen, you see. And he was trying to explain that away. He says, well, that doesn't mean that it's God's will that they all get saved. Oh, really? I said, who will that all men be saved? He said, that means that's his desire. He'd like to see them get saved. I said, no, it's God's will. Don't tell me that it's just his desire. Of course it's his will. And... Um, 
And God wants them. Jesus didn't die for a few. He gave his life for everybody. He gave his life a ransom, the Bible says, for many. And in another place it says a ransom for all. I'm not real smart in some areas, but I know what the word all means. It means all, exactly what it says. So the parts I'll show you here is he wants all men to be saved. Secondly, he entrusts us with the gospel message. Why? Because Jesus ain't here no more. He went back to heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. And the Bible does not speak for itself laying on a shelf someplace, closed up or zipped up in some kind of a, of a cover or some kind or in someone's pocket or in somebody's purse. It doesn't jump out of the pocket of the purse and start witnessing to people. All he has down here is us. That's it. I think it's interesting. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 13, 14, and 15, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they have not in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Many, many years ago in my home church, a big old tall skinny preacher, he says, I want to show you something. And he took shoes and socks off and revealed two of the pastiest, whitest, hairiest looking feet you've ever seen in your entire life. Hadn't seen the light of day, I don't think. And he said, these are beautiful feet. And we laughed. And he quoted this verse. It's because he was spreading the gospel said, I have beautiful feet. Now, you might sit here tonight and have the ugliest feet you've ever seen in your life. And you would, uh, it's like Dr. Hiles said one time, he says, everybody has feet of clay, but I'm not going to take my socks off and show you my feet. Okay, well, I'm not asking you to do that. But what I am saying, if you have ugly feet and hairy feet and pasty white feet and, and dirty feet and all the rest of it, God says they're beautiful if you're out spreading the gospel. That's kind of a neat thing that God says. And if we do not spread the gospel, it will go unspread. Does that make sense to you? If we do not spread the gospel, it will go unspread. And how sad that the Great Commission has become the Great Omission, as I mentioned earlier. So here we find some understanding of the Great Commission. It is a command that has been entrusted to believers. And we are to follow the example of our Savior. And since Jesus has gone back to heaven, he has left the message of repentance and remission of sins with us. And we are to be letting people in this world know about Jesus and that he saved sinners and that salvation has already been paid for. Last verse of scripture I want to give you is I want you to go, if you would please, to Acts chapter 1. Because I guess this would be considered a fifth great commission. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. And songs have been written about this verse. I can hear one in my head right now. But Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 says, as Jesus was just about ready to go up into heaven after his resurrection from the dead, he had been preaching for 40 days and, 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 uh, and he had been, uh, had been ministering all that time after his resurrection. And now he's meeting with some of his disciples just before he's taken up to heaven. And he says to them, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And the Bible says, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And they're standing there, dumbfounded, looking up. And the angel looked at him and said, what are you standing here for? Why stand you here gazing up? The same Jesus which was taken up for you is going to come back in like manner. He says, why are, you still, why are you still here? Get out there and spread the gospel like you're supposed to. That's basically what was being said. And that's what we believe at Timberline Baptist Church about the Great Commission. I want to thank the Lord tonight that the Great Commission has only become the great omission in the lives of a few people in Timberline over the years. I'm thankful that we get to fill that track rack up 
And this week I got out the gospel tracks and did some organizing of them because they needed a little bit of organizing. We've gotten into them so much. And I refilled the track rack. And I was thanking God for every track that I put in the track rack. Thank you, Lord, that I have to refill it. One of our former members, now a member of another church in another state far away, said, Pastor, we don't have any gospel tracks in our church, not one anywhere. Would you please send us some gospel tracks? And I said, I sure will. And I went to the post office and got one of them boxes that cost so much money, if you, no matter what you put in it and how much, as long as it fits. And I went down there and I filled that thing up with gospel tracks. Put them a track wallet, a couple of track wallets in it so uh, they as a husband and wife could be witnesses wherever they go. And then got a phone call within a few days after they were delivered to their home telling me about how people are taking the tracks and they're listening to it and all the rest of it. It's, it's a marvelous thing. Can you imagine a Baptist church without a single gospel track anywhere in it? I can't. I can't imagine it. I've, I've told you about how we had someone come to our church, not a member of our church, and in their church they made you pay for gospel tracks. They made, if you bought a package of tracks for so much money, a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, and they did that so that you wouldn't use them to wrap your gum in or use it to prop open the vent on your dashboard on your car or blow your nose in one of them. They, they, if you bought them, they figured you would take care of them. But here at Timberline, you buy those tracks with your tithes and offerings. That money you put in the offering plate, part of it goes for buying gospel tracks. And someone came in and just stood back there at the track rack and just opened up their purse and started putting tracks in it. <laughs> I thought, praise the Lord, that's wonderful. And just last week, Someone called me up and asked me about God's simple plan of salvation and in a foreign language. And I said, well, we don't have that, but let me call them. So I called LifeGate, and I talked to, I, I talked to Bob Porter's daughter who was working there. She said, well, he's my dad. And uh, she went on about that. She's, he's my dad, and he's in the nursing home. I said, I know he's in the nursing home right now. And, and says, he's my dad. And I said, he calls me his track fanatic in Colorado. And she laughed, and we had a good time. And I said, I need this many. How much does it cost for this many gospel tracks? And uh, I th it was either 500 or 1,000 that I ordered. And they're coming, they're being delivered to this individual's home. The bill already came here. And when they get back into the country, they are going to come to our church and put money in the offering plate to pay for the gospel tracks. Everywhere you go, no wonder John Rice said you need to be like a leaking seed basket. And everywhere you go, dropping seeds here and there. Everywhere you go, the seed of the word of God. Well, I went just a little longer than I normally go, but I just want you to know that right now, it's the same time right now exactly as it was last week at this exact time. Did you know that? It, it, it's exactly the same time. So for what it's worth, shall we stand?